America. Moscow's been hit. It's J Midnight, and this is the beginning of the Black Swan events we were warned about that are going to cascade into a series of events. Lord willing, it doesn't, but let's look at the news and see how. Uh, we've been hearing reports on Western media outlets like the, like CNN and the New York Times uh, of the terrorist group ISIL, Daesh, ISIS, which apparently um, has been reportedly wiped out because we've heard uh, the U.S. Right. say that. And even though oh, they yes. have... We've killed the leader a dozen times. Exactly. But still, they, they seem to um, pop up here and there. But first of all, I mean, I was speaking to... Uh, an analyst before Naboja Malik, and he said that this isn't really Daesh's style. They're not really a five gunman running to a, a, a theater, shoot everybody yeah, out, right. from, and, and hope and hope to survive. They're more of a sort of a suicide bomb, or a, you know, a, mm -hmm. a plot. So that's one thing. On the other, on the other hand, is these there are many people that claim that the, these reports are fake so why as a former intelligence officer why do you think if they are, why what do you think make of it if they are fake or if they're true is this just smoke first what we don't what they're forgetting is putin not these two what the world is forgetting is putin's not dumb he is an a former intelligence officer now, second of all, this wouldn't benefit. First of all, ISIS hasn't existed in a lot of years. Like you never heard of them, haven't you? They've been, we've declared war. I mean, victory over them multiple times, killed multiple heads of their, I mean, their gangs. But they're convenient for this. Because it's not convenient for Ukraine. Because if Russia was to respond by getting more aggressive with the Ukraine, that would fall right into the West hands. So who stands to gain? Well, it, it very well could be. So l let's look at, at this from all three different angles. Number one, let's say the reports uh, are, are fake. The purpose of putting the reports out there then would be to, uh, to divert people's attention from either the real perpetrators or people or governments who could be accused, like the Ukrainians, for example, of now, when he's saying there's people saying the reports are fake, they're talking about the reports that ISIS claimed responsibility for, it, like right after it happened. Having done something like this, uh, my my own gut instinct is that it it wouldn't be the Ukrainians because killing civilians gains them nothing, especially when they would like a fast track to uh, European Union membership. So it, that as a policy, it wouldn't make sense to me. Now, you are right that this is really not the Islamic State style. They generally uh, initiate suicide bombings. Why? Because they hate us more than they love life itself. And so, you know, 70 virgins waiting for them in heaven is worth initiating a suicide attack. Uh, sending in gunmen, close in, killing people at point blank range, as we've seen in the Russian media, and then escaping. That's really not something that they've done in the past. It's something that Al Qaeda has done, for example, during the Mumbai attacks. But Al Qaeda, for all intents and purposes, doesn't exist. And Al Qaeda really doesn't have uh, a, a problem with Russia or the Russian people. So it's, uh, you know, it, it's the early stage. We shouldn't jump to any conclusions. Here's more of what he had to say. ISIS is honoring President Obama. He is the founder of ISIS. He's the founder of ISIS, okay? He's the founder. He founded ISIS. And I would say the co-founder would be Crooked Hillary Clinton. They, they armed these people, they created these people, and they sent them off to fight. And then to say, oh, my hands are clean? No, America's hands are not clean. They haven't been clean since the 60s when they started creating Islamic terrorism left and right. America's drenched in the blood of this world. Now, Putin has came out 
And if you listen carefully to what he's saying, he's telling you who he's basically suspecting of these attacks. Who lost their loved ones. The entire country, the entire nation is in grief with you. The 24th of March will be the day of grief, the day of mourning. We have anti-terrorist measures introduced in Moscow and in Moscow region. What's critical right now is to make sure that th those who are behind this bloodbath are not allowed to do so again. We will be investigating this terrorist attack and we already have some results. All the four perpetrators were directly involved who were gunning people down, killing people. They were found and apprehended. They tried to escape. They were moving towards the border with Ukraine. And we have data that suggests that they were uh, about to be moved towards the territory of Ukraine by those in Ukraine. Our military services, our emergency services, everyone is, our investigators are working on finding out the orchestrators of this terrorist attack, those who gave them transportation, who uh, created, uh, who gave them weapons, etc. The investigative authorities will do everything to identify all details of this crime, but it's already evident that we face not, we face not just a uh, cynically organized terrorist attack, but a massive mass killing of civilians. These perpetrators, these criminals, went specifically to kill, to kill people, point blank, our people, our children, just like the Nazis that once killed our people during the war, they do the same. All the orchestrators, all those who are responsible for this crime will inevitably uh, be res found responsible. They will pay. We will identify everyone who stands behind these terrorists and they will pay. This is a strike against Russia. We know what terrorist threat means, and we expect that other nations that share our pain will cooperate with us and we will stand united against this common enemy, international terrorism, no matter where it uh, shows its ugly head. These terrorists have no nationality and there's only one future for them, retribution and uh, oblivion. Our duty right now, our common duty right now, is to stand together, to stand united, and I believe this will, this we will stand together. Nobody can divide us, can undermine our common strength, strength of Russia's nation or so discord in our multinational society. Russia has faced a lot of challenges in its history, terrible challenges, but it always came out stronger and this will be the same this time. So notice Putin was talking about the orchestrators and everyone involved, including the people that carried out the attack. So he already knows, like everybody should know, there's people who fund, arm, supply, and transport these people to commit these acts, right? Now, Western media put it out faster than Russia ever even acknowledged who was involved that ISIS takes responsibility for it. Why? I don't know, I'm gonna let you figure that out. But look at what Western media is talking about in this article by The Independent. Putin vows revenge as Moscow reels from huge terror attack. The Russian leaders claim that Ukraine was linked to the attack already claimed by a branch of ISIS have been branded absurd. See? So they want Putin to, to think it's 
some Muslim terrorist group that didn't even hasn't even been relevant in a long time. But let's see. Vladimir Putin has vowed revenge after Moscow was hit by a devastating terrorist attack, promising that anyone involved in the assault will be justly and inevitably punished. However, his claims that the terrorists who opened fire at a concert hall and killed at least 133 people had been heading towards Ukraine have been dismissed as absurd. The extremist group ISIS have claimed responsibility for the attack, which occurred on Friday evening at Crocus City Hall when a group of gunmen opened fire with automatic weapons. Now, if you're the Western agencies, you you want this to be put on ISIS because, first of all, nobody knows where ISIS is supposedly at. And you don't want the world to recognize who's really behind this because if the war, if Putin knows and he does know that these people were supplied and funded and orchestrated and this uh, operation was orchestrated in a way that ISIS and most terrorist groups do not carry out terror events. They don't have real trained shooters come through buildings and knock people down. You know what I'm saying? They don't do that. They usually have, you know what they have. Come on, I ain't got to explain that. <laughs> They're taking themselves out with them. You know what I'm saying? But they want to pin this on a group that has no ties to that the world can't tie to the agencies that would benefit from this now this is a trap in my opinion they want putin to over respond on ukraine and therefore escalate that situation to where we have a reason to paint putin as the guy who's the aggressor blah 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 you know what I mean? We paint him as the aggressor. We can take more action and fund Ukraine more because the world is getting tired of funding Ukraine, you, as you are as a citizen of America and whoever else is seeing this in the world. You're probably tired of it. They don't want the war. We don't want the war. But you need events to keep this thing going. Now, Putin's smart, and this is a problem because it's going to escalate because he's going to respond but he's not going to respond the way the West thinks he's going to respond. So in a few in months down the line or weeks down the line, we can come back to this video and remember. It's going to be obvious that it wasn't Ukraine that did this all by themselves. Somebody organized some people out of there properly, paid them, funded them, trained them, and got them to do that. But we'll see. Look at the next uh, step of this situation, how it's going to escalate. Now, the Western agencies had warned about this just a few weeks ago. See, these are the type of things intelligence agencies do. They warned Americans to leave Russia. Even BBC's reporting on it nine hours ago. Did Russia ignore U.S. extremist attack warnings? See, these things are usually telegraphed like this, but only if you're paying attention, you'll pick this up. The Moscow attack raises particularly different issues for Vladimir Putin at a time of tension and mistrust, and much of that comes because of a warning from Washington. The, 7th of, the March 7th warning from the U.S. to its own citizens was unusually specific. It talked of reports that extremists had imminent plans imminent, to target large gatherings in Moscow and specifically mentioned concerts. It advised Americans in the city to avoid large gatherings over the coming 48 hours. The timing may not quite match, but other details do tally closely with the events on the 22nd of March. It seems clear, first of all, the 22nd of March is 322 for those that know about numbers. It seems clear Washington had some kind of intelligence and that it related to the Islamic State, the group that has issued a statement saying it was behind the Moscow attack. As well as the public warning to its own citizens, the U.S. also said it had communication with the Russian government directly. Now, the U.S. intelligence agencies are sending a warning to those around there that it's probably not the best time to be there. Things are about to escalate. Now, let's see another warning that happened a couple weeks ago 
on Tucker Carlson's show with the former congressman, Ron Paul. Thank you directly. How did you, how in 2014 did you see what so many others, including me, did not, that this was a very big deal, what was happening in Ukraine, and that it might end very badly for us? Sometimes the people who are running their operation gives you an idea like, like Victoria Nuland. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so did you hear him? Sometimes the people running the operation give you a very good idea, like Victoria Nuland. Who is she? She is the Secretary of State for the United States. Watch this. U.S. diplomat says Russia should expect surprises on the battlefield. January 31st, 2024. U.S. veteran envoy Victoria Nuland visited Kiev in Ukraine on Wednesday in a sign of support two years into Russia's invasion, saying Moscow should expect surprises on the battlefield. Now, look at this. I have to say that I leave Kiev tonight uh, more encouraged about the unity and the resolve uh, about 2024 and its absolute strategic importance for Ukraine. Uh, I also leave more confident that uh, even as Ukraine strengthens its defenses, uh, Mr. Putin's going to get some nice surprises on the battlefield and that Ukraine will make some very strong success this year. Look, they telegraph these things. You just got to pay attention. And then when, when the things happen, go backwards and then connect it. Nice surprises on the battlefield this year. Okay. Now let's go back to Ron Paul. Jeffrey <laughs> Syatt, you think, what are those people doing? But they're, they're such an example of bipartisanship. Yes. They can work with both of them. And they're, they're the worst kind of warmonger. But all you have to do is you don't have to know all the details. I'm always, I try to be very cautious, you know, especially in economics. Well, I was this, this, and this, and next month there's going to be such and such happen. In Austrian economics, we're not, we're taught that you don't know exactly when things are happening, but we you can see things coming, you know, and it's the same way. You might be able to see our foreign policy coming if you want to go back and observe what happened at the beginning of the last century, yes. you know, with the progressive movement. So it, it, the hints are there. I think it's uh, I think what has helped me over the years is um, I'm, I'm curious most people are, but a lot of people aren't that curious. Yes. I want to know why, why it happened because still the question I happen, you know, like, like, uh, the reason things happen, I said, Who's going to benefit? Who benefits from these bombs being dropped? Who's, who's, who, who benefits? So I, I'm, I'm very curious. And then I don't, uh, try to know everything because I think that, uh, timing and elements and all this, but I'm always impressed that there are people awakening. They wake up and they say, you know, this whole thing about it audit the Fed that came out of a speech I gave to University of Michigan and, that was early in the, in the presidential things. So he's basically saying, if you pay attention, you're going to see the signs. They telegraph this to you. Now, here he talks about, he warns of a black swan event. I think we're reaching this point where uh, some sudden thing is going to happen. I believe I believe in that theory of the black swan. Yes. It's going to pop up and uh, it's, it's not going to be controllable. But people, you ask, what can they do? I think the most important thing is understand what's going on. So this is the problem, though. Sudden events. Now, a black swan event, something that would critically disrupt America. Now, Russia just came out and said, use of SpaceX for spying makes its satellites a target. This is March 20th, 2024. Russia said on Wednesday that it knew about U.S. intelligence efforts to use commercial satellite operators such as SpaceX and cautioned that such moves made their satellites legitimate targets. Reuters rep reported this month that SpaceX is building a network of hundreds of spy satellites under a classified con contract with the U.S. intelligence agency, demonstrating deepening ties between Elon Musk's space company and national security agencies. We are aware of Washington's effort to attract the private sector to serve its military space ambitions. 
Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Maria Zakharova said, such systems become a legitimate target for retaliatory measures, including military ones, she said. Now that's important because if we're going to bait Putin, the West, if the West baits Putin and they're hoping he goes extra in Ukraine, he's not stupid. He knows that the war, he, he knows the West wants to paint him out to be out of control and dominating Ukraine and innocent civilians. So they did this attack, but the West did, in my opinion, but their goal was to bait him to Ukraine, but he's not going to do that. He's too smart. Now, the problem is because he's that smart. Now we have to worry about what his actual response will be, and it's going to be of equal force and of greater surprise. Now, what's on the table for that? He they just gave you a warning. Such systems, satellite systems become a legitimate target for retaliatory measures, including military ones. Now let's keep going down this path. Hello, I'm Michelle McCory. Thank you for joining us. Geopolitical threats have been escalating lately, and now they could lead to a potential kinetic war in space. This was about 10 days ago or something like that. Let me double check. From Kitco News. Okay, about a month ago. The U.S. says Russia is developing a troubling new anti-satellite weapon. White House National Security Spokesperson John Kirby confirmed that U.S. intelligence indicates Russia has obtained this new space weapon, but says it's not operational just yet. And this announcement follows a call from the Republican head of the House Intelligence Committee, Mike Turner, for the Biden administration to declassify information related to what he says is a significant national security threat. Now, President Biden said that while there is no nuclear threat to America, he did confirm that Russia is potentially targeting space assets. Three, that's... First of all, there is no nuclear threat to the people of America or anywhere else in the world with what Russia is doing at the moment, number one. Number two, anything that they're doing and or they will do relates to satellites in space and damaging those satellites potentially. Number three, I, there is no evidence that they have made a decision to go forward with doing anything in space either. Yes, indeed. And as you said, this is what we should be expecting. You did join us about a year ago and you warned that the Russia-Ukraine war was likely to go this way, you expected the Russians to take the conflict to the next frontier, to space, if no. Now remember, this interview from Kitco came out in February. So everything they're talking about is basically lining up with what just happened with Russia getting hit. And what their next step would be. Serious progress was made on the ground. And uh, there is a lot we don't know yet about this potential weapon, granted, and we also don't know if this is just some kind of way to push for a diplomatic resolution. But before we unpack that, I just want to play our viewers a quick snippet from our interview about a year ago where you did warn that this is what we could be expecting exactly at about this time. Discuss this Pearl Harbor that yeah. you say could happen. Who is most likely to launch an attack? Well, the four big threats right now in order in from in terms of near term to longer term would be uh, Russia, China, North Korea, Iran. Russia is the most immediate threat. They have the one of the largest space programs. It's the second largest space program in the world. Um, they're right behind us technically uh, in space. And they've really developed, along with the Chinese, what's known as counter space capabilities. That's the ability to use weapons to deny the Americans access to the strategic high ground of space in the event of a geopolitical crisis, such as what's going on between Ukraine and Russia. So you see, we were our new frontier is space. Russia's our our war of this century is not going to be so much um, of troops on the ground. It's going to be high tech. That's why they keep signaling signaling us about balloons flying over the United States. They're warning about grids going down. They're warning warning about cybersecurity. They're trying to get 
people ready in their mind and they are preparing on the government side for these type of attacks. But let's keep going for a few more minutes. And again, this was an hour long interview. We're going to link it in the description of this interview to get the details there. But you were warning that this could be the next move and attack on satellites in space. Is this the attack you were concerned about then? Yeah, well, they're certainly escalating toward that. Um, yeah, this is what I was warning about. It's funny because with my book, my publisher, when I wrote it, was saying, focus only on China. And I said, no, we have to focus on Russia because that's where the actually nearest term threat's going to come from. It's going to come over U Europe with Ukraine and NATO expansion. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. The Russians have made gains over the last year, but the gains are slow. Uh, and so they're looking for, uh, I think, sort of a game-changing uh, attack. Furthermore, um, they're worried, I think, that Joe Biden, and I think this is an unfounded fear, but I think they're worried that NATO might try to initiate a preemptive strike if it looks like Ukraine is going to fall. So this space weapon will be sort of their ace in the hole. Now, look, he thought it was an unfounded fear. Guess what? He probably predicted the future because now, guess what? Russia just got hit and it's going to get tied to NATO because you don't just get into Russia and then have a bunch of trained people carry out an attack on a major concert with thousands of people around and get away with it and then try to escape back to Ukraine. You're getting funded and supplied and trained to do these type of things. So that's what's going to happen. And he really just said the future because remember, this interview is in February. Right, okay, we're going to have to get back to that unfounded fear about a NATO preemptive strike on, on and on what those targets could be. Before we get there, I want to discuss more about this potential weapon that John Kirby disclosed some information about. I mean, clearly he didn't share that much, given that he probably can't. But here's basically what he had to say, saying that it's a, it's, it's a, a, a threat that is still not yet operational but that it could very well be. Let's take a listen. While I am limited by how much I can share about the specific nature of the threat, I can confirm that it is related to an anti-satellite capability that Russia is developing. I want to be clear about a couple of things right off the bat. First, this is not an active capability that's been deployed. And though Russia's pursuit of this particular capability is troubling, there is no immediate threat to anyone's safety. We are not talking about a weapon that can be used to attack human beings or cause physical destruction here on Earth. All right, I don't know how much comfort I take from that, that it can't cause physical destruction here on Earth, because uh, you think that the destruction that takes place in space can lead to major chaos here on Earth. So what kind of weapon do you think this is? How would it work? What would the impact be? Well, you don't need to have a classified uh, clearance to know the kinds of capabilities that Russia has. So the mo notable one is the co-orbital satellite capability. The, the Russians call this Istribitel Sputnikov. And these are basically tiny satellites. They look like something from a Roger Moore era Bond film. They're tiny s satellites with these grappling arms, and they are really fast, and they go behind our satellites in orbit, and they can latch on with those arms and physically push our satellites out of orbit or damage them some other way by ripping them apart, etc. Um, they, now, they've already been deploying these systems, uh, so for Kirby to say that they don't have those systems in orbit is a little ridiculous. Um, in terms of a possibly undeployed or as yet to be deployed capability, um, there's a laser system that both Russia and China are developing that are designed to knock out our satellites in orbit by blinding, if, it, if it's a, a, a surveillance satellite, blinding the optical gear or frying the communications capabilities of other satellites. And so Russia and China both are developing actively this technology. You can fire it from the ground. It's a laser. It knocks out the targeted satellite constellation. Um, and so that's another capability. Uh, and then we also have, uh, you know, traditional ASAT, anti-satellite kinetic kill vehicles which you can fire from an airplane or fire from a ship fire from the ground which can track into orbit and knock out those satellites uh, so those are some of the big ones and then of course there's the emp threat the electromagnetic pulse um it's you can put them on a satellite in orbit and orbit it over the continental united states detonate it 
and knock out our power grid, or you can just have a smaller device and detonate it to knock out our satellite constellations, which would render us deaf, dumb, and blind on Earth. So those are some of the, the capabilities that Russia has. That's one of those things that, that Kirby's talking about. So now we're going to jump to if they use these space weapons, what will be the effects militarily and for civilians? But if they're going to try to keep it surgical, they're going to use either co-orbital satellites or they're going to use a laser to try to blind our systems to buy them time, create a window of opportunity on their for, for their forces on Earth uh, to exploit while we're still deaf, dumb, and blind. Um, the, the, the downside, though, if they do end up knocking out more than the military, is exactly what you said. It's going to knock out our banking. Something like a trillion dollars washes across the earth every day in electronic, perfectly timed electronic uh, transactions, as you know. And that capability is rendered because of satellites. And if you knock out those satellites, for a period of time at least, that money is going to vanish. Those transactions won't be able to be done. You won't be able to dial 911. You won't be able to use your debit card or your credit card. Or now remember, multiple times now in the last year, we've had our cell phone communications go down nationwide in large groups, in large areas, and 911 services go down, and disruptions to pharmaceuticals, which will be a big problem if we really do get attacked. If the grid is affected and critical infrastructure is affected, there's a lot of people who depend on medicine every day. You know what I'm saying? So it could get crazy. For Apple Pay to get gas at the pump, literally all of our electronic life in the West will ground to a halt if enough of those satellites are taken out. At the very least, everything will slow down. And, uh, you know, in modern warfare, speed kills. Yeah, absolutely. And we've had a lot of guests speculating about a major attack on infrastructure right. that could happen in the next year with some having different theories as to why that attack could happen but before we get to that i one second now not even just guests on the tv and stuff are predicting this the government's been preparing for this watch this this week our government has been warning governors across the states to prepare for infrastructure cyber attacks. Oregon's reviewing water infrastructure security following cyber attack warning. I'll show y'all the document, the letter that the government sent to the governors. Oregon's Enterprise Information Services, the agency charged with the maintenance and security of the state's technology systems, are reviewing recommendations from the U.S. EPA and White House about potential cyber attacks on water infrastructure. In their letter to governors, EPA Administrator Michael Reagan and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan cited two recent and ongoing threats from actors linked to the Iranian government Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps and a Chinese state-sponsored cyber group known as Vault Typhoon. They referenced foreign attackers late foreign hackers late last year breached the municipal water authority of Aliquippa in western Pennsylvania near Pittsburgh, disabling controllers used to control and monitor water processes and wastewater treatment. In that case, the water authority took the system offline and switched to manual operations. So, something as critical as water. If we get attacked by water and it's not to actually shut the system down, it could be to act to um, potentially increase a dose of a chemical that treats the water, which would make the water toxic to a human, like increase chlorine or something like that, or increase fluoride or something like that. There's a lot of things that are added and treated with the water that would be toxic in certain doses and that you could pull off with a cyber attack. Now, here's the actual letter to governors, March 18th. This one is to Washington. I mean, my bad. This one is to the governors from Washington. Disabling cyber attacks are striking water and wastewater, sy wastewater systems throughout the U.S., these attacks have the potential to disrupt the critical lifeline of clean and safe drinking water, as well as impose significant costs on affected communities. We are writing to describe the nature of these threats and request your partnership on important actions to secure water systems against the increasing risk from 
and consequences of these attacks. So this is where they name who the threats are from, uh, Iranian government. And then we got the People's Republic of China. Drinking water and wastewater systems are an attractive target for cyber attacks because they are a lifeline critical infrastructure sector, but often lack the resources and technical capacity to adopt rigorous cybersecurity practices. So they continue and they go on about how the governors should go about securing these facilities and technologies. But let's get back to the interview. I want to talk a little bit more about whether you think this is really an attack intended or just some huge threat in order to push forward some kind of diplomatic resolution. Because last time you joined us, you said that if Putin can't win a conventional military victory on the ground, that he could look at these more radical options like the space pull harbor scenario that you described. Uh, February 24th, the Ukraine war will enter what its third year now. It doesn't look like either side is closer to winning. It's not going Russia's way, arguably. And there is a speculation that just talk of this may be a way to push forward some kind of diplomatic off-ramp. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. so uh, when I talked to you about a year or a little bit more than a year ago, um, it's true that Ukrainians were doing somewhat better than expected, which is why I was saying, you know, ultimately Putin's not going to let this thing go. Um, now it does look like in the last eight months, the, the, the tides have shifted, however slowly, in Russia's favor. But he's, but Putin still wants to end this conflict. So, um, you know, either way, this, this technology, this, this threat uh, is either going to be used in a use it or lose it kind of space Pearl Harbor, uh, where there's no off ramp now. This is sort of a fait accompli, which is really horrible to think about. Uh, or this is a diplomatic sort of, you know, uh, canard he's using uh, to try to lull the, the Biden administration to the table. Right now, I am leaning more toward diplomatic kind of, kind of trying to threaten the Americans to the table right. uh, because it does look like Russia is slowly but surely turning things in their favor. However, um, I mentioned earlier, and I'll say it again, Putin is hyper paranoid. That Tucker Carlson interview, he came across as a crank. Uh, and so I think that Putin and the people around him are living in an alternate reality where they may have convinced themselves that NATO is getting ready to preemptively strike. And so they're going to take a use it or lose it approach. We will know more if and when Russia launches that system into orbit, because once they put it into orbit, that's it. They've got the capability, and the only way we can negate that capability is by directly attacking them, which is an act of war. Now, look, in February, he thought Putin was paranoid and coming off as a crank, but and that he was feeling crazy, that Putin's kind of crazy for thinking NATO would preemptively strike Russia. But guess what just happened March 22nd? Russia got attacked and a lot of civilians got killed. Now. Putin's going to ask who who orchestrated this event, who made it possible to do this, who stands to benefit. So now this guy, he's probably thinking right now, as I record this, that Russia got hit and now the ball's in their court and Putin's not stupid. So we are definitely ran by a bunch of madmen <laughs> that... They could care less about the consequences of these actions at a certain level, or they're, they're willing to sacrifice a certain amount of people and a certain amount of damage to everybody to conduct their little games. Now, it's not Putin being crazy no more. He just, Russians just got hit, hundreds of people. How does Putin respond? He just got elected, right? He has to show strength and he has to get his people to rally behind him, right? So it's up to them. Now, when it comes to grid down scenarios, the American government's been preparing for this and they don't really they, they don't really make this a big thing for the public because they can't panic the public. But they've been floating this idea to Americans about phones going down and electricity problems, those type of things. I'll show you a report that's basically goes over this scenario. This is a report called the President's National Infrastructure Advisory Council Council, and it is titled surviving a catastrophic power outage how to strengthen the capabilities of the nation 
December 2018. Now I'm going to show you something real quick in it. Here's the summary. The nation has steadily improved its ability to respond to major disasters and the power outages that often result but increasing threats, whether severe natural disasters, cyber physical attacks, electromagnetic events, or some combination present new challenges for protecting the national power grid and recovering quickly from catastrophic power outage. The President's National Infrastructure Advisory Council was tasked to examine the nation's ability to respond to and recover from a catastrophic power outage of a magnitude beyond modern experience, exceeding prior events in severity, scale, duration, and consequence. Simply put, how can the nation best prepare for and recover from a catastrophic power outage, regardless of the cause? Now here's the highlights. What is a catastrophic power outage? An event beyond modern experience that exhausts or exceeds mutual aid capabilities, likely to be no notice or limited notice and could be complicated by a cyber physical attack. Long duration, lasting several weeks, imagine several weeks with no energy, no electricity, to months due to physical infrastructure damage. Affects a broad geographic area covering multiple states or regions and offering and affecting tens of millions of people. Causes severe cascading impacts that force critical sectors drinking water and waste systems, communications, transportation, health care, and financial services to operate in a degraded state. Now watch this. See, the difference with me and all them other people is I bring you to the real news, the medical science, the sources, all of it, to the source. This is the... Energy Sustainability and Society, a biomedcentral.com study. Right here, review. An assessment of threats to the American power grid. This was 2019. Concern has been raised that the electrical grid of this nation is vulnerable to prolonged collapse. The postulated mechanisms are geomagnetic storms. These are, this is space weather, solar flare, CMEs, electromagnetic pulse attacks, EMPs via a high altitude nuclear detonation, cyber attacks, and kinetic attacks. The likelihood of such events and the consequences to the American public of a protracted electric power failure are reviewed. Now let's scroll down. The potential vulnerabilities of the American power grid for a prolonged collapse have been the focus of several congressional hearings and commissions. There has, however, at this time, been no formal analysis of this issue in the academic peer-reviewed literature. Now, the intent of this report is to provide an objective summary of the current science and controversies on this issue for policymakers and the interested public. public. Now, here's the key. In testimony before a congressional committee, it has been asserted that a prolonged collapse of this nation's electrical grid through starvation, disease, and societal collapse could result in the death of up to 90% of the American population. There's no published model disclosing how these numbers were arrived at, nor are we able to validate a primary source for this claim. I can, I know where they got it from. Testimony given by the chairman of the Congressional EMP Commission while expressing similar concerns gave no estimate of the deaths that would accrue from a prolonged nationwide grid collapse nationwide grid collapse. Now these are the possible ways that we just discussed. But here is the key part. Consequences of a sustained power outage. This is where you get to how you can arrive at 90% of people dying. The EMP commission states commission states should significant parts of the electrical power infrastructure be lost for any substantial period of time the commission believes that the consequences are likely to be catastrophic, which they know because we just did a report to the president about this. <laughs> and many people will die for the lack of the basic elements necessary to sustain life in a dense, urban, and suburban communities. Space constraints preclude discussion on how the loss of the grid would render synthesis and distribution of oil and gas inoperative. No energy. Telecommunications would collapse, as would finance and banking. 
Virtually all tech, infrastructure, and services require electricity. An EMP attack that collapses the electric power grid will collapse the water infrastructure, the delivery and purification of water, and the removal and treatment of wastewater and sewage. Outbreaks mm -hmm, that will result from the failure of these systems include cholera. It is problematic if fuel will be available to boil water. Lack of water will cause death in three to four days. Food production would also collapse. Crops and livestock require water delivered by electronically powered pumps. Tractors, harvesters, and other farm equipment run on petroleum products supplied by an infrastructure, pumps and pipelines, that require electricity. The plants that make fertilizer, insecticides, and feed also require electricity. Gas pumps that fuel the trucks that distribute food require electricity. Food processing requires electricity. In 1900, nearly 40% of the population lived on farms. That percentage is now less than 2%. It is through technology that 2% of the population can feed the other 98%. The average under cultivation today is only 6% more than in 19. I mean, sorry, the acreage under cultivation today is only 6% more than 1900. Why is Bill Gates and them in China buying a lot of U.S. acreage for land, for farming? Why? See, you got to tie all of this together. Productivity has increased 50-fold. Now look, if we were no longer able to fuel our agricultural machinery in the country, the food production of the country would simply stop. Because we do not have the horses and mules that used to tow agricultural gear around in the 1880s and 1890s. Now you see what we're talking about? A grid collapse of prolonged length would render us back to we don't have horses and mules. This is how crazy it is. And this don't have to be man-made. This could be solar related. You know what I'm saying? They're already talking about that. So the situation would be exceedingly adverse if both electricity and the fuel that electricity moves around the country stayed away for a substantial period of time. We would miss the harvest and we would starve the following winter. People can live for one to two months without food, but after five days they have difficulty thinking and two weeks they are incapacitated. There is typically a 30-day perishable food supply at regional warehouses but most would be destroyed with the loss of refrigeration. The EMP Commission has suggested food be stockpiled for a possible EMP event. Now here's the sad conclusion. A prescription for failure. Even if all the recommendations of the Congressional EMP Commission were implemented, there is no guarantee that the grid will not sustain a prolonged collapse. There should therefore be contingency plans for such a failure. There's also another consideration. The foundational pil pillars of prior American nuclear defense policy in today's climate are of uncertain validity. Mutual assured destruction is the Maginot line of the 21st century. Um, <laughs> Non-proliferation will prove difficult to resurrect. The consequences of a widespread nuclear attack have been positioned to the public as massive deaths from blast effects and then further lingering deaths, deaths from the effect of radiation. We suspect there will be no electricity, and there will be no electricity for a very long time. There should be an actionable plan in anticipation of a possible prolonged collapse of the grid, a retrostructure, and a skill set to provide a framework for survival. Our, our sense is there is no plan. Now, we know that grid downs or any sudden events like this Moscow attack that leads into another escalation that leads into something bigger can cause automatic trauma to the financial system. And we all know the Federal Reserve and the U.S. government want to create a, they want to get rid of the cash U.S. dollar and start a central bank digital currency that can be tracked from how you spend it to where you spend it. And they don't want people to have privacy and anonymous transactions that you still have with cash. Now, what would you need for that? The perfect scenarios that we've just been talking about. Now, this is Lynette Zhang, 
the founder and CEO of Zhang Enterprises. This inter interview was a few days ago, two days ago, and she's on Kitco News News too. And she advises to invest in hard assets like gold and silver. But here she's talking about what would lead us into a system that what would lead us, what type of scenario would lead us into converting to an all digital currency. Well, what, go back to 2008. That wasn't that long ago. And the whole country went up in arms with that 800 billion bailout. But Congress did it anyway, didn't they? Because the crisis would justify that behavior. Now, if the next time the, and I was there in 1987 on Black Monday. So I know what a stock market implosion looks like and feels like and tastes like because I was a new stockbroker when that happened. And that justifies a big enough crisis that scares enough people, justifies all of a sudden giving people, well, look, look what happened during, you know, the Cerveza crisis just for, amazingly four years ago now right and all the money that they pumped into the public hands to spend that's going to enable the entrance of a u.s cbdc but it's got to be a big enough crisis and so this will be it's got to be obvious it's got to have impact immediate impact and then you'll see how fast Congress will change tunes and all of a sudden the U.S. CBDC will be given to everybody. And I, I do want to say that in a number of those countries that have been experimenting with the CBDCs, they're not necessarily getting public buy-in. Now, China is an exception to that, but Nigeria is a country that tried to issue the CBDCs, but they didn't get the public, but 5% of the public to participate. So they created crisis in order to get higher participation. Don't buy it, right? But if all you have is inside the system and the system implodes and you lose your income and you lose your wealth and they give you this these CBDCs for free, you're going to go out and spend them. The question is, will you get any any new money that you get? Will you put it back into the CBDC? Will you adopt it? If you don't have food, water, energy security, barterability, wealth preservation, community, which is arguably the most important piece anymore, and shelter, you're not going to have choices because you're going to be beholden to what Ever they want you to do. And that fine tuning, yeah, they said it. We can have a finger on the economic button 24 7. So they want you to spend, we're consumer. Look at it, it's the consumers that are being tasked with supporting all of this garbage that they've created because we've been witnessing this consistent and steady risk transfer from the few to the many from the old hands that used to buy treasury bonds to the new hands, the mutual funds and the individuals, this is hot money. So when enough risk has been transferred to the public, I'm telling you, you'll see it. That's when it will become too expensive to support this game, but they are working voraciously at getting those CBDCs everywhere in the world even though the public in many places has spoken and do not want them, they will cram it down our throats. And unless you have something that is truly outside of the system, what choices will you have? None. You're going to have to do, there's your social scoring. You're going to have to do what they want you to do. Now we know the final goal is total control. And if you are a kingdom warrior, you already know. And the second beast required all people, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead, so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark. The name of the beast or the number of its name. So this is a glimpse of the future that they're preparing. See, people will be thinking the Bible's fake, but... Are you ready for a new world order? Because it ain't a conspiracy anymore, ain't it? Look. 
Are you ready for a new world order? What underpins a world order is always the financial system. Hmm. I, I was very privileged. My father was an advisor to Nixon when they came off the gold standard in 71, and so I was brought up with a kind of inside view of how very important the financial structure is to absolutely everything else. And what we're seeing in the world today, I think, is we are on the brink of a dramatic change where we are about to, and I'll say this boldly, we're about to abandon the traditional system of money and accounting and introduce a new one. And the new one, the new accounting, is what we call blockchain. It means digital. It means having an almost perfect record of every single transaction that happens in the economy, which will give us far greater clarity over what's going on. It also raises huge dangers in terms of the balance of power between states and citizens. In my opinion, we're going to need a digital constitution of human rights if we're going to have digital money. Uh, but also, this new money will be sovereign in nature. Most people think that digital money is crypto and private, but what I see are superpowers introducing digital currency. The Chinese were the first. The US is on the brink, I think, of moving in the same direction. The Europeans have committed to that as well. And the question is, will that new system of digital money and digital accounting accommodate the competing needs of the citizens of all these locations so that every human being has a chance to have a better life? Because that's the only measure of whether a world order really serves. So you see, it's already on the table. This is 2022. Now, the goal is to take advantage of a crisis and use it to get us into that new financial system that will be able to track everything every human does, and it'll be able to hold them to certain requirements to be able to buy and sell. And only the great book predicted that, but it ain't no predictions because it's revelation, which means it was already written. It's going to be what it's going to be, and it is what it is. But yeah. That's Jay Midnight, Midnight Hustle, you know what I'm saying? Bringing you the real information and helping you tie it together and letting you know that the kingdom is real and that pay attention to the games going on, but first pay attention to the king of kings, Jesus, because salvation is here. We got to take that. You dig? Peace out.